because we're waiting for them to uh, get going here and now we're recording. Um, I wanted to just kind of ask everybody to ask your questions in the chat. Um, please don't just uh, jump in and ask them. We'll ask them in the chat. That way we can, um, we can address them as they're asked. And also if we run out of time during the live portion, the speakers can have a chance once, they're, once their presentation is concluded to jump in and answer the question in the chat so everyone can see it as well. So with that uh, quick house housekeeping note, we're gonna get started. Our first speaker is Raul. He is um, from the New York Genome Center and he is going to give us a nice uh, presentation about ASMUF, which I'm not going to try to explain it. That's what he's here for today. So with that, Raul, I'm gonna turn it right over to you. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks Robin um, for the introduction and chance to present. And so I'm gonna give um, a, a little bit of an intro uh, into some of the tools that we've been developing for the Human Biomolecular Atlas Project or HubMap. Uh, and then actually most of this um, presentation will be a live demo that I'm hoping I can convince uh, some of you to follow along with um, and maybe try out for yourself. But let me start by sharing my screen. Okay. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about methods um, for reference-based mapping of the human body at single cell resolution. Um, and just to introduce this idea of reference maps, um, I want to talk a little bit, uh, just introduce this analogy with the Human Genome Project, um, which is, of course, one of the most fundamental and, and useful reference maps um, that the community has built for genomics. Um, and I want to draw a contrast between two related but actually distinct processes. The first is the process of actually assembling the human genome, of actually building the map. Um, and the second is, is the actual process of mapping to it once that reference has been built. And, and the process of assembling the human genome um, was an extraordinary uh, international collaborative effort. It took you know, a decade or so um, to, to be able to build this map. Um, in general, uh, it requires building a reference map generally requires relatively high quality uh, and uniform data. Um, so for example, you know, this, there's some disparity here, but the, but the Human Genome Project was built from a pretty long reads that were kind of on the average of about 500 base pairs um, for each read. Um, and the process of assembling the human genome also required some very complex computational tools, these genome assemblers um, with lots of parameters and, and people you know, with, with incredible computational expertise building these tools. And it makes sense that this takes time and it requires high quality data because the process of assembling the human genome is basically the process of putting a puzzle together without knowing what the picture is on the front of the box. You don't know what you're trying to achieve. You just know that everything sort of stitches together somehow. And that's a really, really difficult and time consuming and challenging computational problem. But once that has been accomplished, once that reference map has been built, the process of mapping to it, of mapping new data to it, can be remarkably fast and easy. Um, and actually, the same people who built the, the human genome assemblers um, also built uh, one of the first human genome mappers. Many of you have used the BLAT tool on UCSC. You just type in your sequence, um, you hit map, uh, or you can even hit I'm feeling lucky, like in Google, and you get your results in, in milliseconds. And so this process of mapping to the human genome is almost instantaneous. It's rapid. Um, it's fully automated. You can do millions of reads per minute. Um, you don't have to do them one at a time. Of course, you know, all of us can use and have used um, uh, genome mappers. Um, this process is, is accurate and pretty robust. Uh, default parameters work great. Um, it's compatible with what would comparatively be very low quality data. Even 20 or 30 base pair reads, 25 or 30 base pair reads can map, not 500 base pair reads. Um, and the reason you can do this is because there's already so much information in the reference and we can use that information to help us interpret new data sets. Uh, and so that paradigm of, of mapping to a previously built reference, we think the same thing is, is going to start happening um, for single cell data as well. And, and this is where some of the tools we've developed for HubMap uh, come into play. Um, so HubMap is, is trying to build a map um, of the human body um, at cellular resolution. And you know, right now, particularly when we're dealing with single cell genomics data, that involves unsupervised analysis. We don't know all the, the types of cells and states that are present in the human body. And so we need to discover them um, for the first time. Um, and and many groups are using unsupervised analytical pipelines. For example, my lab has a software package called Syrah, but there are many others that people can use to discover cell types in single cell RNA-seq data. And there are many, many steps in those pipelines. There's quality control, there's normalization, there's feature selection, dimensional reduction, visualization. 
Um, clustering, which is obviously a, a very parameter heavy choice, you know, how finely grained do you cluster? And, and these, are, these are difficult and time consuming procedures. Um, and they're very heavily manual, especially that problem of taking the clusters and actually assigning biological names or cell types. This process of manual cell type annotation can be extremely laborious um, and, and time consuming. Um, all of this is challenging if you just have one um, sample, but it's particularly challenging if you're doing data integration and you have multiple studies. So, of course, all of this is doable, and, and you know, this is very much what we're doing in the context of HubMap, is, is trying to build these reference maps um, through unsupervised analysis, but it is slow, it is manual, um, and it, it doesn't involve quite a lot of human input. And so what we'd like to do going forward, especially if we can build those reference maps, is to use them to enable the same thing um, that, that, that reference maps did for the human genome, which is to enable people to rapidly map their data um, onto these references. So we want to build a supervised platform. And actually, the, the, the bullet points here are the same that I showed you before. We want it to be rapid and fully automated. We want it to be accurate and robust um, to a variety of parameter choices. Um, we would like our, uh, our automated reference mapping to enable low quality data. So maybe, maybe your data sets aren't quite as deeply sequenced as the ones in HubMap, but hopefully our reference, because there's information there, we hope that it will enable, help you um, to interpret your new data sets as well. So we want to build this kind of automated and, and fully unsupervised um, mapping pipeline. Um, and that's what we've done, and that's what I'm going to demo for you today. Um, this is a tool um, called Azimuth, and the goal is to have a, a, a tool for reference-based single-cell analysis. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you a brief overview of, of what it is before I demo it for you. Um, I want to highlight first that in order for us to use this tool, there does have to be a reference data set available. So somebody has to build a reference, and that requires unsupervised analysis of multiple single-cell data sets. Uh, and that's exactly what we've been doing in HubMap, and particularly in the Hive components, we've been building these reference maps based on single cell data. Um, the reference maps I'll show you today um, include data produced both within the HubMap community and outside the HubMap community. Um, we, you know, there's obviously a huge amount of information in the literature, not just in this in, in HubMap. We want to use all of it. Um, and that process of data integration and annotation for building these references is something that we've performed um, collaboratively. So, for example, we have four references at the moment. Um, and the references for the human and the mouse um, uh, motor cortex um, have been built um, uh, in collaboration with the Allen Brain Atlas. Um, and in fact, they, they provided um, annotations based on their sort of uh, really best in class annotation platform and cell ontology that they've built um, at the Allen Institute. Um, so we have four references um, with many more to come, but I do want to highlight that that process is something that we go through and it, it takes us a long time to build those references. There's, as I mentioned, there's a lot of collaboration and human input, but the hope is that now that we've done that, um, it makes a lot of downstream analyses easier for new um, query data sets. And some of our goals when, when we started to build Azimuth um, were to have a tool that first was fully automated and online. We wanted it to be accessible to anyone, even if they didn't have a programming background. We wanted something that was fast and highly scalable. We want to be able to app, map tens of thousands of cells in seconds or minutes. Um, we'd like the tool to be able to provide sort of new biological insights, more than you could get if you just analyze the data on your own, because we are bringing a reference and therefore information into the analysis. Uh, we want the tool to be interactive and to facilitate exploration. We want it to be fun to, to use and, and help you understand your data. And lastly, we wanted it to be reproducible, um, fully versioned, uh, documented, uh, and, and something that really the community could build on top of. Um, and hopefully we, we've released our first draft and, and, and hopefully we meet, um, meet these standards and that's what I'm gonna try to show you um, today. Um, so I'm gonna switch now um, at this point to a, a demo. Um, the link to the demo is below. I'm gonna put it in the chat in a second. Um, it's azimuth.hubmapconsortium.org. All of this is free and, and open. Um, I'm going to go through the demo slowly in hopes that some of you might be willing to click on these links um, along with me. We'd love to, to have you try this out for yourself. Um, we'll use demo data sets that are preloaded into the app, um, but maybe you'll find it useful um, and think about using this on your own data at some point. But let's get started. So... Actually, I may not be able to, I'm going to stop sharing just for one second so that I can put this in the chat. Okay. All right, so um, you can see here that I'm on um, azimuth.hubmapconsortium.org. Um, there's lots of information on this site. There's an FAQ and, and sort of a general workflow, but I'm going, to, I'm going to walk you through all of that right now. 
Um, as I mentioned, we have four different references um, that you can currently use in this context of the app. For the demo today, I'm going to take the human motor cortex, but you can try any of these. Um, they all have demo data sets available. Um, and you're going to start just by clicking on go to app. So that's going to take a few uh, seconds to load, and, and I'll wait to give people, if they're interested, some time to try this out. Um, the app is, is going to show us first um, an interactive way of being able to explore our reference data set, and I'll tell you more about the reference, and then give us an opportunity to upload um, new data. Um, so what I'm showing, what you're seeing right here um, is, our, is our reference, um, and that reference is generated um, from 10x genomics v3 data with the annotations provided by the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about this reference and exactly how we created it in a DOI, for example, and all of these things in a minute. Um, but in addition to the, so you can, you know, you can kind of explore the reference here a little bit. This is an interactive plot, so you can mouse over each of the cells in the reference. There are about 76,000 cells. You can see that each cell has been annotated at multiple levels of resolution. So there's a class label, which is very broad, sort of like non-neuronal or, or glutamatergic um, or inhibitory or GABAergic. Um, there's also a subclass label, which is higher resolution, and a cluster label, which is even higher levels of resolution. So we have sort of a hierarchical cell ontology that's been provided by the Allen Institute, and I'll show you how we can map to all those different levels of the cell ontology. Um, so we, we are going to be able to load a demo data set automatically um, into the app. Uh, you can also load your own data. It's just a counts matrix. We don't want you to normalize your data or anything up front, just a pure counts matrix, um, kind of kind of a raw data to be to be input into the app. Um, the data, the query data set that we have here is about 6,500 cells. And I want to highlight that this data set was produced actually with an entirely different technology. This was produced with SmartSeq. Um, but we're still going to be able to map it. Um, we're still going to be able to map it uh, to our reference. Um, so we can start um, and we can do some QC uh, if we want to do so in the app. So let's say that I want to filter my cells, for example, based on the number of, of reads that were detected in each individual cell. So I'm just going to do that as an example. This is an optional step. Um, but we're going to set some QC thresholds and you can set those visually or however you'd like. Um, I also want to highlight that, as I, as I said, we can map to actually multiple levels of resolution. So we're going to map to the subclass level and the cluster level in, in this case. Um, and then we're just going to hit map cells to reference. And you'll notice in this process that there are no parameters that I've set. Usually there's lots of parameters when you analyze single cell data. But the reason there's no parameters here is because we're using information that we've already learned in the reference to interpret our query data set. And that makes us just dramatically, um, dramatically faster. Um, so you can actually see all of the individual steps that are happening um, down here. It's going to take about a minute or so um, for this to run. Um, I'm going to go to a new, um, I'm just going to show you, while, while we're running that, I'm going to show you some other things that we have, um, if you're interested in learning more about the reference, for example. Um, so you can click on the Learn More tab um, if you're interested. Um, and you can see sort of some information about the reference, you know, for example, how many cells or nuclei were involved, obviously what species it was. Um, we also have a link to the original publication, uh, which I believe is now in press, um, uh, where, where this data was reported. Um, and so, that we, you know, we want to be really transparent about where this reference data is coming from and decided appropriately. Um, so, you know, in this case, uh, the data was integrated. Um, it's just one study, but it was integrated over two individuals. Um, but in other cases, like for the pancreas, there are actually six different studies that we pulled together across the literature um, to be able to build an integrated reference um, across studies and across technologies. Um, that integration step um, does have some parameters. That is obviously something, as I mentioned, that we do collaboratively with the community. Um, we want to be very transparent and open with exactly how we do those steps. Um, and so uh, if you're interested and you want to know exactly what parameters we used um, for each of our reference, you can click on um, SnakeMake. Um, you can see that there is a uh, stake make file that you can run that will perfectly reproduce um, building that reference. You can see exactly um, each line of code that was run. Um, if you're interested just in kind of the, the actual single cell analysis code, um, you can see all that as well. But the goal here is to be sort of fully reproducible. Um, and then for each of our references as well, uh, we also have a Zenodo um, link, which you can click on. You can get a DOI, um, for example, for this reference, because um, obviously we're going to update these things every time. You can also download this reference if you want to run it on your own computer. Um, we want this to be sort of compatible with, with versioning and updates, as I'm sure it will be. Um, and then the last thing to say is that for each of our references, um, we have many, many cell types that we're going to annotate, of course. And for each of those cell types, we have a, a table on the website where you can see the name of the cell type, 
um, its closest match in the OBO cell ontology, and the list of biomarkers or gene, our genes that we feel are the best kind of differentially expressed markers that describe the cell type. And we found that very useful also um, for being able to visualize. And we have this for hundreds of cell types uh, on the website. Okay, so now we can um, go and take a look at our results here. Um, so you can see that sort of um, everything looks like it worked well, um, that the mapping worked well and it, it passed the QC checks. I should say, by the way, everything that I just showed you was sort of you know reproducing, building the reference. You, you don't have to do that. The app loads all this in automatically. Um, but our goal is to make this as easy to use as a black box, um, but we don't want it to be a black box. We want there to be kind of a detailed reproducibility and, and description behind it. And, and that's kind of um, why we have this uh, accompanying website. Okay, so um, the, the mapping worked well. You can see it took about um, a minute and nine seconds to map um, 6,000 cells here. Uh, Azimuth supports the mapping of 100,000 cells or more um, in the app. Um, and uh, you know that, that takes about uh, seven or eight minutes um, to, to run uh, if, if you're interested in, in scaling to that degree. Um, so uh, now we can look at, at sort of our results by first looking at our cells. And so what I'm showing you on top is our uh, actual reference. Um, so you can see it's the same plot I showed you before. Each of these cells um, is, is from the 76,000 in the reference. And on the bottom um, is our query. Let me zoom in a little bit here if I can make this a bit bigger. Uh, on the bottom is our query. So each cell is one of the 6,500 cells in the query data set. Um, but you can see that now it's been projected onto the reference. And so now we can visualize this query data set in exactly the same kind of UMAP space as we had previously visualized the reference. Um, you can also see that each query cell um, has been assigned an annotation um, based on the categories in the reference. And again, this is an interactive plot, so you can mouse over the plot and see for each cell um, what category was assigned. Of course, you can download these results as well. Um, if you look closely, you can see that we also assign a prediction score um, or a level of confidence associated with each of our annotations. Um, in many cases here, we're quite confident um, in our ability to map, but in some cases, our prediction scores dip a little bit. So that's valuable information to have. And um, we learn the scores per individual cell. Um, I should also say that you might have some metadata that is associated with each cell or sample, like the donor it came from, for example, or the gender. Um, so you, know, you can plot those along. Um, so as I mentioned, there's two different um, uh, genders here, for example, or there actually, you know, there's also some, some spatial or regional metadata. Um, that's associated with each of these samples. So you can see that as well and plot that side by side. Um, and you can also make a sort of contingency table that tells you, you know, for each sample or for each gender or for each metadata category, how many cells did you observe with each subtype? That's very useful sometimes if you're trying to compare kind of healthy and disease samples. Um, so we found that useful. Um, another thing that I want to highlight, uh, as I mentioned, is that it's possible um, with azimuth to be able to map samples at multiple different levels of resolution. Um, so, for example, I've shown you what happens if we map at the level of subclass, but we can also map at one higher level of granularity, um, in this case, the cluster level, which was also provided by the Allen. And you can see now that when we map um, in the context of cluster, we get many, many, many more um, uh, categories. In fact, uh, you can see, just see how sort of much higher granularity we go to. It's almost too much display on the plot. Um, if we go to this higher level of granularity, which is which is quite exciting, you know, this population of cells here, for example, we would have um, at the lower level of granularity, we would have considered them LAMP5 cells, but at the higher level of granularity, um, we split them into two different categories um, of LAMP5 interneurons. And so it's useful sometimes to be able to see that higher level of granularity as well. Of course, when we go to a higher level of granularity, it might affect our confidence. Um, so particularly for cells here kind of in the middle, you'll see, you'll see that our confidence score drops a little bit if we go to the highest level of granularity. Um, but you, know, you get to choose kind of what level of, of resolution you want to map your cells at. We find that useful to see. OK, so that's how you can look at your cells. Um, we also want to make this easy to explore. And that means we want to be able to look at genes or features as well. Um, so that's what I'm showing you here. Um, uh, now, all of the data that I'm showing you in this tab, it's all the query cells, um, but we're looking at them after they've been mapped kind of onto the reference view map and, and annotated. Um, so you can see, for example, that the gene PVALB um, is very highly expressed in, in this area of the UMAP. Um, and you can see that it's very highly expressed in um, PV uh, interneurons. Um, and so, you know, that, that's kind of interesting for any gene that you might be interested in. We can take, for example, GAD2. GAD2 is a marker of inhibitory cells. Um, and we can see where that's kind of expressed uh, nicely on the heat map. 
Um, so it's nice for exploration, um, but you may also kind of not even know what genes are interesting or what genes are markers of your individual clusters. Um, and so ASMF actually uh, automatically pre-computes um, the best differentially expressed genes for each of the clusters in your query data set. Um, so for example, if you were interested in PV interneurons, um, you can see that PVALB is the best marker, um, but the second best marker is another gene um, called TAC1. Um, and you can see that that gene is also very highly expressed um, in PV cells specifically. And it's quite useful to be able to do this um, for any of the, um, any of the uh, cell classes that you might be interested to see what are the best kind of differentially expressed genes and markers um, that pop up. Um, I also wanna mention that you can, as I said, visualize um, prediction scores um, for any of these classes. So for example, if we're interested in oligodendrocytes, we can see that we annotate almost all of them with 100% confidence. Um, and the same if we look at, for example, LAM5 um, interneurons. Uh, the last thing to, to say is that um, we, we want this to be easy to download um, uh, your results uh, and to explore them in any downstream tool um, that you're interested in. Um, so we make it easy, for example, to download, for example, the, the UMAP coordinates or, the, or for each cell to download the um, prediction scores. Um, so that's going to be an Excel file, which I'll just open in a second. So, oops. so you can see what that looks like. A little slower. Um, so you can see that for each cell, um, now in, in, in any tool, but I'm just using Microsoft Excel, you can see on the name of the cell what we have annotated as um, and the prediction score. So you can pull that into any um, tool of interest. Um, and we also make it possible to download an analysis script template. Um, so in case you sort of want to run this analysis entirely on your own, uh, on your own computer outside of the app, um, you know, we, we, we make it possible to do that. So you can just run exactly the series of commands and reproduce everything that we're showing you um, kind of on the website. Okay, so that concludes kind of the demo that I wanted to show you. Um, it took a little bit longer than I had um, intended, um, but I, I, I will just to say that we, we envision lots of biological use cases um, associated with this particular tool. Um, I, I won't go through them in detail now, but um, one of the things that we've done quite a bit of, um, which I'm happy to answer questions about, is to take data sets from disease individuals. Um, for example, we built a large reference um, from human blood of human PBMC. Um, so we've taken data sets from disease um, and mapped them uh, onto our reference. Um, and when we map data sets um, from healthy and disease individuals onto the same reference, it makes it very, very easy for us um, to go back and compare and to say exactly what cell populations are differing um, in their abundance or their gene expression between healthy individuals and diseased individuals. And so in this particular example, uh, we noticed that in COVID-19 patients, there was a very strong depletion of mucosal associated invariant T cells or mate cells um, in COVID samples. And we were able to validate that with the, um, uh, with the authors of the original study um, using, uh, using CYTOF. Um, there are also some other fun things we can do that I won't go through for, for in detail for time. For example, um, we were curious whether we could actually map across species. Um, so as I mentioned, we have um, the human and mouse motor cortex as references. Um, so what we did is we took the, the mouse, uh, a mouse motor cortex data set, and we mapped it um, onto the human example. Um, you can see that they actually map quite nicely. Um, so this is the mouse data set after mapping it onto the human. Um, and that's because there is extensive um, molecular conservation between human and mouse, especially at the subclass level. And this is something that the Allen Institute has reported. Um, one thing that's kind of fun is actually there's a population that's extremely highly abundant um, in humans um, that's almost missing entirely in mouse. This is a population of LAMP5 positive um, interneurons. Um, and this is actually a result that's been discovered, um, not, not just by us, but by other groups, in particular Steve McCarroll um, in the community. Uh, so just to conclude and to leave a few minutes um, for questions, um, we've developed a tool um, called Azimuth um, for, to enable you to map um, your query data sets um, onto references. Um, we hope this, data, this tool is accessible um, and fast and scalable. Um, since we released the first draft version in October and the more updated version through HubMap a few weeks ago, um, we've mapped more than 20 million cells that have been uploaded by the community. Um, we hope that this tool not only is kind of fun and easy to use, we also hope that it improves your ability to annotate your data sets because you're bringing in information um, from the reference. And so, you know, just like with the human genome, um, we should be able to do better with supervised analysis than when we're analyzing data in an unsupervised way. Um, and lastly, we automate the process of biomarker discovery, which is very useful if you're interested in finding markers for your different clusters. 
Um, we have four references online right now, but we're, um, we're planning to extend this across the human body. So please stay tuned for more references soon. Um, there's a subset that we already have demos for and are in the process of trying these out with collaborators in the biological community. Um, and we'll continue um, to update this website um, as in myth.hubmapconsortium.org, um, which I will repost in the chat because I, when I thought I had put it previously, I had just sent it to, to Robin. Um, but uh, you know, hopefully this is something that you guys find useful and I'd be very happy to take any uh, questions or comments. Thank you. So oh, there's a question. I'll go through some of the questions um, in the chat because I'm trying to keep track of them for you. And the first question is, um, well, it's a comment and a question says, great tool, when you plan to release kidney references and do you collaborate with KPMP for reference samples? Absolutely, so that's a great question um, and a particularly relevant one We're for, because KPMP I think has released um, a series of both publications and, and very high quality reference data sets from both single cells and single nuclei. Um, it is absolutely our intention, not just for the kidney, um, but for other organs as well, to, to make sure that um, you know, it's not just a hub map effort, but that we're bringing in um, input and feedback um, from other groups in the community, including the CZIC network for the kidney. Um, specifically in the context of KPMP, we're fortunate that the hub map kidney investigators, and in particular Sanjay Jain, um, is also a member of KPMP. Uh, and so it sort of works naturally in this context to make sure that the groups are working together. Um, this is something also that Katty Borner, who's going to speak after me, is, is very passionate about, is making sure that we build tools that are sort of inclusive of the broader community and leverage multiple types of data. Um, so yes is the short answer um, and the long answer to your question. Okay, um, Ben, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of call you out here because I saw that you had a conversation with Alan um, in the chat, and I just want to make sure that you got your question answered that you were looking for from Raul regarding cell ontologies to include finer grained um, subtypes. I did, thanks. I just wanted to make sure that that was something in process. Thanks a lot. Great. Yeah, so, so you know, the, the question is about updating the cell ontology. And again, this is actually, so, so both Kati and I, we lead what are called mapping centers for HubMap. So our goal is to help people map, you know, both build maps and, and map it to, to our, our references. Um, so Kati, as I'm sure she'll tell you in a minute, has been leading efforts to build sort of updated versions of cell ontologies that, for example, would capture these higher resolution annotations that have, you know, don't previously exist in the cell ontology because they've been discovered through single cell experiments. Um, and, you know, Kadi is in, in close um, collaboration and contact with OBO to make sure that sort of, you know, as these things get reported and validated in the community, they make their way into the cell ontology as well. Um, she may want to answer something now or, or kind of talk about it in, in her presentation. Kadi, you're welcome to unmute if you'd like to. All right, she has her thumbs up, so that's good. <laughs> okay, the next question is, is there an assumption on the cell type wise distribution of the query data set? That's a great question. And I, I didn't have time to demo this, um, but in our most recent update, there is not. Um, so you, you know, for example, I was gonna show you a demo and I didn't where we just took dendritic cells, which are 1% of human blood and just uploaded those into our human blood atlas. Um, and everything maps to dendritic cells only. So even if your query data set only consists of a small proportion of the reference, or if there's a dramatic skew in cell type proportions or composition, um, we still can map, uh, we think very accurately. And we've done a lot of tests um, to, to make sure that that's true. Um, but please do, if you have cases like that, where you have a query data set that consists of a subset of your reference, um, please do try it out and, and let us know. Don't just, just don't just take our word for it. Um, we do have a feedback tab in the app in the app that we'd love to, to hear kind of how the app worked for you. Great, thanks, Raul. There are three more questions in the chat that we don't have time to handle live right now. But if you could take a minute and maybe answer them in the chat, and we'll move on and introduce Kadi and her team at IU who are going to tell us all about their registration user interface and the visible human massive open online course that they've developed. Thank you, Robin, and thanks um, also for organizing all of this. Can you hear me all right? Yep, we can hear yes. you great. Wonderful. So Andy will run the slides. He will also run a demo for all of you and inspired by Rahul, we will also try to make it possible for you to follow along. I think this is a great way of doing it. Next slide, please. So this is an effort not just by the MCIU team, but also by the larger HubMap community. And in fact, there are now 16 different consortia engaged in authoring um, not just the ASCT plus B tables, which capture the structure between anatomical um, 
artifacts and, and structures and cell types and biomarkers, um, but also uh, walks them over to 3D explicit reference organs. Um, so it's, it's a massive effort and it's actually good that I spent quite a bit of my career on information science because it's an information um, management problem ultimately. <laughs> Next slide, please. So as part of um, HubMap, as you know, we deeply believe that space matters. We actually need to consider where these tissue samples came from, where which um, cells are in the vicinity of other cells, how cells make up uh, functional tissue units, how millions of um, functional tissue units are, make up an organ. And so collectively within HubMap, we are developing what we call a common coordinate framework. And on the next slide, um, you see a uh, representation of how these anatomical structures cell types and biomarker tables are then used um, to also uh, create ontologies, um, pautonomies, like uh, for instance, for the kidney shown here, where you have part of relationships between anatomical structures, but also cell type typologies that Rahul just presented in his demo, um, where you have um, higher order uh, cell types, and those are then um, detailed in, in more and more specific cell types and cell states. Ultimately, these ASCT plus B tables, they're also used to develop a set of 3D reference objects um, that are then made available via the HubMap reference library. And we now also link over to other 3D reference organs developed by other um, consortia such as Spark and um, the Allen Institute and others. So on the next slide, um, you see the many, many experts in the ACT plus V table working groups. And in fact, I will just present or add a few more links here to the um, chat uh, window so that you also get to explore some of these. All right, um, so you have here more information on the CCF effort itself, also with a link over to the CCF uh, re reference object library. You have more information on the working group that you see here. We meet once a month and it's a very open group. Every expert who would like to um, contribute is welcome. If you register via this registration link, then you get um, invitations. You also get updates on progress made. On the next slide, you will see the ACT plus B reporter that was developed to see how complex these ACT plus B tables actually are. So you have in red on the left-hand side, a autonomy of uh, anatomical structures. You have in the middle, the cell types. Uh, here, uh, lymphocytes and uh, endothelia cells are highlighted. And then on the right-hand side, you have biomarkers. And currently we only distinguish genetic and proteomics um, biomarkers. Going forward, there will also be a proteoforms, there will be lipids and metabolites. But right now we are restricted just to those two. There's also a link here to the ACT plus B reporter and uh, maybe somebody from our team can put that link into the chat as well. On the next slide, you see an overview of the CCF 3D reference models that now also exist and that are used in the CCF user interfaces so that you can register tissue in relationship to the speciality of a reference organ, but also then explore existing tissue sample data sets in the context from where they were harvested and uh, in which they can be um, understood and ultimately also um, to run metadata uh, studies, it's very important to actually understand exactly where these uh, tissue samples came from. On the next slide, you see the progress we have been able to make so far, thanks to the many, many experts that have joined this effort. So we now have the anatomical structures, cell types and biomarker tables for 11 organs, and they are listed here on the left-hand side. You also get to see for these 3D reference organs, how many anatomical structures exist for the male, and sometimes they are left and right organs here with L and R indicated. 
You also get to see um, how many exist for male or female. There are slight differences. Um, the, most of the data that was used comes from the Visible Human Project um, made available by the National Library of Medicine. And of course, there needs to be a very close correspondence between the um, tables and the reference organs here shown on the right hand side. You also get to see how many anatomical structures, cell types, and biomarkers exist for the different organs. And as you see, the vasculature has the topmost number of anatomical structures. Next slide, please. So here's the registration user interface that uh, many of you might have um, seen. And Andreas is going to give a demo of it on the next slide. After you have registered your tissue, you can actually then explore it in the context of other tissue samples, but also in the context of the organs from which it was um, taken. And um, you can then click on one of those um, reference tissue blocks and you can um, get a listing of all relevant uh, tissue sections derived from it on the right hand side. Then click on one of those tissue sections, go over to Vitesse uh, developed by the TC at Harvard Medical School, led by Niels Galenborg's team. And um, you can explore it using the Vitesse tissue browser. On the next slide, um, we go over to the demos that Andy is going to run. And I think he's also going to show you a little bit more of the user studies he has been running for that user interface. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kadi. Right. So um, I assume that many of you have already attended one of my real demos. So in my demo, I'm going to mostly focus on the new features that we have. Um, briefly to set the stage, again, the idea of the RUI of the registration user interface is to document tissue extraction sites uh, by registering tissue blocks with a 3D reference organ. Okay, so let me uh, go on over to the Rui screen. And I'm putting into the chat two links. One link leads you directly to the registration user interface that you can access with uh, most web browsers and also a link to an archive preprint um, that I'm gonna talk about in just a second. So uh, recently we released Rui version 1.5 which you can see here on my screen. And feel free again to go to that link and uh, uh, just follow along the steps or play around with it as you, as you please. Um, so usually, if you're part of HubMap, you would access the RUI through the ingest portal. So in the ingest portal, you can actually open up um, a spatial registration, and then the RUI opens from within the ingest portal. Now, currently, we are uh, just accessing it from the outside. We, in fact, have quite a few non HubMap users that have used the RUI. So this is the kind of workflow I'm showing you, but the core workflow is the same. So first, I'm going to put my name up here. Here we go. And let's do this correct. Let me use my real name. Here we go. Then we choose a reference organ. Let's go with the left kidney. So that is one of the changes. We have this organ carousel up here and uh, laterality is now part of the organ carousel. Um, we choose our sex, let's just leave it at male. And then you can see that our 3D stage has changed. So we have a um, semi-transparent male uh, left kidney here. Um, you can see that it is now um, transparent. So that is one of the new changes. By default, these structures are not transparent at 20% to be exact. Um, here on the right side, we have our tissue block. This tissue block represents the, well, the tissue block that we want to register with regards to this reference kidney. Now, the first thing we do is we set the size of the tissue block. So I'm just going to go ahead and set that to eight millimeters by five millimeters by two millimeters. All right. So you can see it has resized as we typed in these new values. Okay. Uh, now I can go ahead and I can move this actually into my kidney. Let's say I want to move this here towards the upper pole. And now, of course, this is only one viewpoint. I kind of want to see what's going on, you know, from different perspectives. We have these uh, radio buttons up here that allow you to change the camera position. So now we can look from the right side, like, and that is with regards to the full body, the full body orientation. And you can follow that with the use of this little gizmo up here. So watch this little mannequin here as I am moving around my camera. You can see that the view adjusts and we can always, we can always see where we are with regards to the full body. Okay, so let's say I wanna move this a little farther up here. And then let's also say I wanna adjust the rotation a little bit. So we have these three rotation sliders. So let me, 
it's actually the wrong rotation. I can reset all of these values here with these circular arrow buttons. Then I move this like this way. And now, of course, I want to explore this in a little more, a little more freely by getting the full spatial context of what I'm looking at. So I can go to this 3D view. Now the 3D view allows you to control a what we call an orbit camera. So you can rotate the camera with your left mouse button. You can zoom in with your mouse scroll wheel or with your touchpad, depending on what input device you use. And you can also pan the camera, meaning just moving it sideways with your right mouse button. And this then allows you to inspect this basically in full 3D. And then you can make sure that what you're registering here is actually what you, in the way that you want to register it. So I can, for example, say, ah, I really don't like this rotation just yet. Let me adjust this rotation a little more. All right. Now, here on the left side, we have two accordion menus that I have ignored so far. So the anatomical structures accordion menu uh, shows you all of the anatomical structures. And these anatomical structures on this level correspond to entries in the ACT plus B tables that Kadi was mentioning earlier. Now, what I can do here is I can go ahead and for, for each of these, I can individually set the opacities. So for example, on Friday, I had a, I had a case with uh, an external collaborator and we registered tissue slices for four different organs. And we always had to make sure that these register registration were actually inside the organ. Because as you actually can see, with this being you know, a 3D tool, it's kind of hard to tell, is this inside the organ right now or is it outside? Like We don't want anything poking out there. So then what you can do is you can actually go here and you can adjust the opacity, for example, of this outer layer to 100%. So now I can see, okay, there's nothing yellow poking out. So I did a good registration. Okay. Uh, likewise, I can reset this opacity by clicking the circular arrow button back to 20%. Or I can just turn it off completely by clicking this eye icon. And so this way, if I wanted to, I can just switch off everything here layer by layer until I have you know, isolated, for example, these inner structures of the kidney so that I can make a more precise registration if I choose to do that. Now, another thing that's interesting about these anatomical structures is I have this anatomical structure tag uh, accordion menu down here. Now, as you can see, as I expand this, we have a few entries in here called pills. So as I, if I go back into my registration view, let's go over here and I move my tissue block outside again of the kidney, you will see that all of these tags will disappear. So what we use here is a, um, a system called what's called collision detection. Collision detection is used all the time in 3D animation to determine if two structures are overlapping. Now, if you've watched any Hollywood movie, you know that if two structures overlap there, there's gonna be like an explosion or something's gonna crumble. In our case, it's gonna be much more innocent. You just get a pill down here. So I move this tissue block in here and then you can, you can see as I actually start touching the kidney we see all of these pills popping up um, and this is metadata that is additionally saved out later on as we uh, export our data uh, of course there are some um, adjustments you can make here for example if you're like ah, this is definitely my sample is definitely not from the renal medulla you can just click this x and it disappears uh, likewise you can type in an anatomical structure um, here and then you can just, for example, add it back in or add one that has not been uh, that has not been discovered by collision detection. All right. Uh, one more thing I wanted to point you to is the common extraction sites down here. In the case of the kidney, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we only have one so far. It's the bisection line, so I can turn it on here, and then I see this green bisection line. Let me go back into 3D view. So now we have this green bisection line added in here, and of course I can also adjust the opacity for this. These sliders are really the latest addition uh, specifically to manipulate the 3D stage over here. And now I have a much better visual idea of where things are with regards to the bisection line of the kidney. And we have extraction sites for each of our supported organs. In the future, we hope to support different sets of extraction sites depending on which consortium our user is from. All right. And then one of the other new features that is really neat is the upload previous registration data button down here. Now, um, in order to demo that, we have to first generate some data. So uh, let's say we like what we did here, uh, registration-wise, then we go to review and download. Okay, so I click this button, and then I get this uh, review window that shows me all of the data that I just generated. So we have the first name, last name, we have the reference organ name, we have some geometric information, 
uh, like the size of our tissue block, the position, et cetera, et cetera. And then these structural tags, the pills that we see over here, uh, with, along with the timestamp and an alignment ID. So then I can download this registration data and I'm just gonna lazily put that on my desktop here real quick. And uh, we save this out as a JSON file. This JSON file looks like this. Okay. And now when I go back to the registration user interface, I can upload a previous registration. So let me just refresh. Let's say it's a couple of weeks later, you are going back into the registration user interface. Um, I'm gonna type in my name again. To the kidney. And then I, so this is a, a currently a new tissue block. Now I upload my previous registration. And then we see that the tissue block is properly resized and properly repositioned and now lying inside the kidney again. So if you have registrations with previous JSON files attached to them, you can upload them into the new version and um, properly register them there again. All right, that concludes this demo part um, of the RUI. Of course, you can post any question that you have into the chat. You can also always write me an email. Um, one more thing, we um, recently conducted a user study where we compared uh, the kind of 2D interface, a simplified version of it anyway, with two VR setups. Um, there are some key insights listed here on the slide. We basically, we determined that uh, while VR is faster than uh, the 2D version, it is not more accurate, at least not in terms of position. And the raw numbers that we got for people after training with the 2D version made us basically confident that the RUI is a fast and accurate tool to use going forward. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about it, we submitted the paper to plus one for review. There is a preprint available. I've also posted that to the chat earlier. Maybe Ellen, maybe you could just re uh, repost that, uh, that link really quick. All right, in the interest of time, I'm gonna hand it back over to Kadi now. Thank you. Great demo, thank you. On the next slide, um, we wanted to make sure that you all saw that there is a visible human massively open online course. I know some of you, maybe all of you, or many of you are teachers also, uh, and you might like to take the course yourself, but you might also like to um, point your students, your colleagues, and maybe even your family members to it because they might all have questions about what you're doing at work and, and how this all relates to us understanding what counts as um, human and us healthy in um, human adult uh, data. So this um, Visible Human Massively Open Online course was developed to communicate tissue data acquisition and analysis within HubMap. But now we are also starting to take on some non hubmap data. And in fact, you will see KPMP acknowledged on every single slide and video we have here because we deeply benefit from this collaboration with KPMP. Um, we also demonstrate single cell analysis and CCF mapping techniques in the VH MOOC. And we continue to introduce major features of the hubmap portal. The learning modules that you see here, they are not just videos with interviews or tool demos, um, but they are also hands-on exercises and self-quizzes. So you can really use this to build um, into existing courses or to build new courses around this material. And by the way, if you would like to showcase your work, please do feel free to contact us. So you see there are there is a website that anyone can use to register for free for the course. It's a never ending course currently, <laughs> it's advertised as such. And um, there are three instructors and actually we all three are here. So Ellen is here, Andy is here and myself. If you go to the next slide, you will see that for the first HubMap photo release in October, 2020, we had six modules. One was an overview of HubMap. Some of you might have seen the video for that. Um, then there is a very neat uh, presentation by the Vanderbilt team by Jeff Spragan's group on how they collect tissue data and analyze it. Um, Rahul gave a great introduction into CIRAT. Um, there is a session on CCF ontologies, 3D reference objects and user interfaces. And then there is a portal video that introduces the very, very first HubMap portal. In addition, we have Mike Snyder arguing for open consenting your data in support of research. So on the next slide, 
you will get to see the two new modules that we just um, added. So there's one on ontologies, um, which is a very gentle introduction by Mark Mewson from Stanford Un University on how ontologies can be used to organize the world. And um, there's also a, another video on the ACT plus B tables because some of you might not be familiar with them. And um, this video is made for you. So please come in and um, just enjoy this material. There are also two forthcoming learning modules. One is on codex data and cell segmentation by Gary Nolan. And the other one is uh, on photo design and usage. And this is for the summer 2021 photo release. On the next slide, you will see a learning module example. So here uh, we went into the CCF ontology um, section into the learning module. And as you see, it's not just one overview video of how this all works together, but there are also supplementary videos that for instance, introduce the very first version of the registration user interface or the original version of the exploration user interface or um, present an interview with Kristen Brown, which is the expert artist um, scientist, which actually has created many of the three models, not all of them, but many of them. On the next slide, you see different um, modules that actually get you involved. So um, you get information on how you become an author or reviewer of the ACT plus B tables. You get to see how you can explore your own 3D reference organs. So you can now download these organs from the HubMap um, GitHub site. And then in order to actually see them in 3D, if you click on this and go to the next slide, Andy, then you get to see um, what you have to do to uh, get some of those uh, data that's downloaded, how to then open them in a web browser, which is Babylon.js. And um, you also have a, a few small tasks to solve to get a few points so that you really know that you uh, did it correctly and you are now mastering opening and exploring 3D reference organs. On the next slide, you see the same overview, but now let's zoom into the registered tissue blocks via the registration user interface. So again, on the next slide, you see a little ex example um, exam where you, or assignment, exam sounds scary, um, assignment where you now get to register a tissue block that was just extracted from a kidney. And so again, these are very, very hands-on uh, assignments that anyone can do and um, feel free to check them out and also send us your feedback. On the next slide, we can go to the very last um, section here in this particular learning module, which explains how to manually annotate human tissue. And this is particularly relevant for the annotation of functional tissue units. So we now have annotations for um, 5,000 plus glomeruli that uh, are currently used in the um, HubMap Kaggle competition, uh, where we are interested to develop a more robust and uh, more general FTU detection algorithm. And um, this uh, information can also be used to annotate functional tissue units in other organs. And so it's, it's wonderful for us to just be able to um, point experts to these materials and then answer questions as needed. On the next slide, uh, you see that it's not just um, the learning modules that make up the BH MOOC, but it's also um, a discussion forum. And then there are also announcements that get you uh, involved in HubMap, but also give you update on what just happened in HubMap or in other consortium. On the next slide, you have uh, again the link to the Visible Human MOOC. We hope you all check it out and uh, let us know if you encounter any issues and also let us know if you want to be featured in the MOOC. Thank you all. So we are ready to answer questions. Andreas is here again. Alan also is very much involved in the VH MOOC. And um, if there are questions, please let us know. Thanks, Patty and Andreas. That was a great presentation. And Raul, if you're still out there, that was your, your presentation was awesome too. I kind of skipped that part in, in an effort to keep things moving. Um, but if y'all have any questions that you'd like to ask our presenters today, please um, leverage the chat here. And uh, if not, we can wrap things up today. We can give it a minute. If you um, think of any questions after this wraps up or an, any, anything you want to ask either us at HubMap or just the presenters themselves, 
Um, feel free to shoot us an email instead of giving you all their direct emails. You can send us an email at help at hubmapconsortium.org and we'll make sure to um, forward the questions and connect you with the right people. Uh, it looks like we're not having any, any additional questions, but I don't want to rush anybody in case they do have some questions. Um, I'm giving another second. I'll just keep rambling for a minute and make sure nobody has any additional questions. I should I should have a a list of um, random things to talk about, um, but it looks like we're starting to lose some folks. So um, with that, I think we can wrap things up for today. Thank you again for everyone for joining us and asking all of your great questions and our awesome speakers and members. And we will be posting this recording on our YouTube channel and we can follow up with the link for you all uh, later this week once we get that uploaded and, um, and edited a little bit. So um, thanks again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you on the next Zoom session sometime soon. Thank you for organizing, Robin. <laughs>